you're going into an area that's been devastated by a storm. They really don't want to hear you rolling in with the loudspeaker mounted on your Winnebago, blaring Van Halen. You're going to get lynched. This was inappropriate. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we ask, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video even is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Gene Lyons, and along with me is my co-host, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And tonight's special guest, Hal Salstrom. And we're going to take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films hold up. Each week, the audience selects from our four, count them four, movie choices that we break out in their race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. At the end of each podcast, Big D and I provide the audience with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective bums. Find a comfortable spot on the sofa and accompany us for a journey through our vast VHS movie collection. Uh, This week, we'll be reviewing the 1996 uh, weather drama and thriller Twister, which was up against some stiff competition, but came out way ahead. Uh, Big D, what was it up against this week? Yeah, this was the 90s disaster movies, and there were some big ones, and I had always been pulling for Armageddon, uh, partially because I love the movie and also because I know that Roger despises it. Uh, Also, Titanic, Independence Day, but... For some reason, weather-related films, it, it kicked ass. I think it got like 70% of the vote. Now, I think a part of that had to do with the fact that Bill Paxton recently passed. And uh, I think if, you know, God help me for even saying this, but if Leonardo DiCaprio had just died, we, I think we'd be watching a very different film here. I personally was really hoping for Titanic just because I waited years to watch it with the right woman and eventually ended up watching it by myself. And really, guys, you are the right woman. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Hal and uh, why we picked him to uh, take the Roger seat for this cast. So yeah, so Hal Salstrom uh, is filling in for the Raj, who is in Denver right now on business and couldn't join us. He actually had his MacBook Pro, uh, iPad, and all of his other gear stolen in a very festive American flag backpack. So instead, we've got uh, Hal here, who uh, is a, a resident weather expert. So I'll let him introduce himself and... Uh, and tell you uh, what he's doing here with us to review Twister. Yeah, so I'm actually on my way from uh, Las Vegas to Denver uh, looking for tornadoes or any other weather-related phenomena in a Jeep that I cut the top off of so I could actually see the weather better. I have a 360-degree view as I drive down the road and spot clouds or clouds of birds or tornadoes or anything else that's going by. Uh, Recording this all on my GoPro for analysis after I get home. And I'll report that to the National Weather Agency and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and uh, see what they think of it. It's, it's really quite amazing that he actually ended up stopping right by my house on his way back to Denver. Somehow, the, the route between Las Vegas and Denver comes through Arizona, as all good roads do. So I'm, I'm glad you could join us, Hal. I look forward to your insights on twisters and other weather-related weather related phenomenon, including Helen Hunt in a white... Weather filleted phenomenon and also Helen Hunt in a white tank top. Yeah, and also if you're in the Denver area and you happen to come across a uh, a MacBook Pro iPad on Craigslist or uh, someone on the street selling it, please pick it up. Tell Roger. Otherwise, we're going to get inundated with Roger dick pics being released online, and and none of us want to see that. So Raj really hates when you when you bring up the dick pics, but he what he really loves is uh, is facts about the movies we're about to review. So I, Hal actually had a really great point to bring up that kind of keys off why the hell they made so many weather related movies in the '90s and kind of frames this entire discussion of Twister. So Hal, you want to share that with us? Yeah, well, nineteen you know the mid 1990s, post Gulf War version one, the U.S. was really without any geopolitical enemies that it would have been politically correct to use as uh, villains in a movie. So we went with things like aliens, cloud formations, and weather phenomena. I think we also had asteroids. I think, was that, Big D, was that the era when we had, like, Armageddon and all the other asteroid bombing movies? 
Yeah, we had the first. It was the asteroids. It was Deep Impact. It was Armageddon. Uh, then we had some volcanoes. We had Dante's Peak. We had volcano because you know volcanoes just always you know pop up in L.A. Then I think there was also yeah you know, we had the fog, which was kind of weather related. And uh, but whenever Hollywood gets a hit, you know whether it's a, a cowboy movie in the in the early '90s, they just beat an entire genre to death. Uh, as we're going through right now with zombies, but yep, we needed an enemy, so Mother Nature was uh, a perfect candidate. So I, I missed Twister entirely in the in the '90s. Uh, I saw, I mean, I was familiar with the cow flying around and all that other shit, but I really didn't really watch the movie and get really to the heart of this deep drama uh, that was happening between Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt. So the first time I watched this movie in full, it was uh, earlier in my relationship with my current girlfriend. Uh, Caitlin and she and I were were talking about our favorite movies, and she brought up Twister, which she saw when she was ten and fell in love with. Uh, we watched it together. I told her what I thought of it, and that's really when she knew she was dating a brutally honest asshole. So uh, she she now in the second viewing with me that she, we did this week agrees with me that this is not a great movie. How about you, uh, Big D? I don't remember really seeing it in the movies because you know at this point I I was in college. And I think I had other things that interest me other than films about weather, no matter how exciting they were. But I do remember the ride at Universal Studios. Uh, and it was you know, one of those simulators that you, you, know, you do the entire queue. And while you're waiting in line, there's half of the truck from the movie and things embedded in the wall. Uh, it was a good ride, good fun simulator. Uh, I saw it upon one of my visits to Universal before I moved to Orlando. Uh, but sadly, it was decommissioned in, in 2015, and it's getting replaced by Jimmy Fallon's Race Through New York. Uh, I don't think I'll be waiting in line for that. I was uh, I was pretty pissed off, actually, when I was at the Universal Studios Hollywood, and uh, they told us while we were on the, the little tram that goes through the back lot, they said, you know, you might see... You might see some famous people uh, while you're out here. And then up on the screens pop Jimmy Fallon, who, listen, I, I apologize to anybody who's a big Jimmy Fallon fan. Never found him funny. Never will find him funny. Uh, I was just so disappointed that that was the, the host for the afternoon. So one of the things I think is funny about this movie is that actually the, the Motion Picture Board gave it a PG-13 rating uh, because of intense depictions of very bad weather. <laughs> So I, I don't I don't know that that you know, warranted a PG thirteen. Has that ever been used prior as a justification for any rating at all? Actually, uh, I I don't know. I'd need to do more research on that, but I I can imagine that some parents might want to keep their kids uh, away from very bad weather. Now, last week we did uh, Raising Arizona, which had a, a fairly modest budget compared to the ninety two million dollars. Uh, spent on Twister. And I think that's going to come into play when we discuss a lot of the things that uh, as, as far as the effects and, you know, the impact this movie had on us. Uh, so but this movie did turn a pretty big profit, right, uh, Big D? Yeah, it had a budget of 92 million, which was pretty big at the time, and it grossed 241. So it was a blockbuster. And watching it today, I felt most of the special effects held up pretty damn well. Most of the funnel clouds and destruction were great. It was obvious the only thing they really struggled with was at the end when they were trying to drop large objects that they really couldn't master it in CGI. So you could tell they just like lifted the the Reaper, like the Harvester, like 30 feet off the ground. And then the camera would pan around and they would just drop it. Uh, you know, they would just drop other large metal objects. Uh, so for what they had to do practical and what they did special effects wise, the 92 million, I think it turned out something that held up pretty well. Yeah, so without further ado, let's roll straight into that trailer and get started cutting into 1996's Twister. There is a mystery. Elusive. Unpredictable. Violent. It terrifies most scientists. But for a new breed... The challenge is saving lives. The research is deadly. The laboratory is nature itself. And potentially uh, could be a storm that has a wind in excess.
All right, it's June 1969, and a young family takes shelter from an impending tornado. The father, in an attempt to save his family, tries to hold the storm cellar door down, but gets sucked into the tornado and killed. Watching in horror are the man's wife and his daughter, Joe, who, despite the horror of the storm and losing her father, is entranced by the funnel. The film cuts to present day and meteorologists at the National Severe Storms Laboratory, or NSSL, discussing a building storm system over Oklahoma, which could produce a record outbreak of tornadoes. Okay, so first of all, if I'm living in the Midwest, I'm without a doubt having a storm shelter. And one of the key parts of having a storm shelter is doing proper maintenance. How did that guy let that door and latch get to such a state of disrepair? But just letting that go. The woman is sitting there completely stunned and just looking around. He gets sucked out and the daughter starts walking for the door. And what does the mother do? She just kind of eh, nonchalantly grabs the daughter. So you're talking about a lot of the stuff that's inconsistent in the movie. And, and I want to start off, you know, as I always do, because I'm the optimist of the podcast. Everyone knows. I, I want to talk about something they got right. You mentioned the farmer and his wife. I lived in Ohio for five years, and this strange mismatch that happens in Tornado Alley with the incredibly fit farmer and then the sort of uh, pudgy wife, this this rings true to me. I, these were the couples that I saw and probably why I remained single pretty much uh, you know, during my duration there. Uh, the movie is startlingly accurate in that regard. Yeah, I lived in Kentucky and uh, Tennessee when I was in the military, and you're correct, the active farmer all day ends up getting in pretty good shape. What I found strange was, yes, their wives were generally larger. Many of them seemed to like it. And I don't know if it was their proclivity to working with livestock or uh, just the women that were in their local towns, but they really didn't seem to have a problem with it and actually seemed to be attracted to the larger women. Well, I think after a, a long day of being out in the field, you just want a, something soft to, to, to plow into. And, uh, you know, a, a nice round woman uh, really fits the bill. Yeah, as long as she's nice to you, I'm okay with it. It doesn't matter what you look like. But this woman was clueless. Uh, somehow, dad is sucked up. Obviously, mom's not going to get sucked through that door. But Joe, she, I don't know how she didn't get killed. Uh, but she took this, you know, catastrophic event that would have normally traumatized someone and turned it into a career. So we, we spoke about some of the the accuracy in, in the movie. And again, we're looking forward to some of the great effects. But I want to talk a little bit about about some things they got wrong right off the bat. I mean, this this movie tells you from the get go, it's not going to be a, a picture in authenticity. Uh, Joe's dad at the beginning says that the storm is an F5. This is 1969, and the Fujita system hadn't even been invented yet. Also, they pan across the living room, and the, the TVs got weather radar, which also had not been invented. I, you would think with a, a film specifically about tornadoes uh, placing itself in a specific time, they had to pick 1969, they would have gotten at least this part right. So again, credibility is out the window to begin with. Well, they had to do it because they'd already picked Helen Hunt as the female lead, so they probably just did the math, walked it back, and figured... Uh, anyone who's sitting here on a Friday watching a, a, a movie about tornadoes uh, where the tagline is like one hell of a ride isn't going to be a historian of meteorology. First of all, that was the original tagline for our podcast. So I was really pissed to find out that uh, <laughs> that Twister took it. But but here's the thing is Joe's dad could have just said uh, it's going to be a really bad storm. And then on TV, they could have said uh, maybe there's going to be some tornadoes coming. They didn't they didn't have to go that far. And I feel that this movie repeatedly takes terminology to try to show us how extreme something's going to be. See, but again, that's kind of where you've lived. I grew up in the Northeast. I now live in the Southeast. I don't know anything about tornadoes more than what I watch on the Weather Channel or, uh, you know, on the news when it hits. But to me, someone who lives in an area that's, you know, often hit by hurricanes, hurricanes are the best natural disaster you could have by far. You see it coming. You have time to prep. If you want to leave, you can leave. If you want to board up and get a generator, you could do it. Wildfires out in out west scare me a bit, but nothing is more, I think, horrific or, or terrifying as a tornado. They just is that real? Can they just pop up out of the blue? Do you have some warning? You know, the storm system comes through. They could tell it's probably a tornado-producing storm. You have some warning, not like an earthquake or something. 
Well, is it true that a lot of times the problem they have is false alarms? That they will always err on the side of being cautious? So if you do too many false alarms and set the sirens off, people don't respond. Yes. And they have problems with that even when they do set the alarms off. Still, yeah, people just don't do anything or ignore it. Uh, Do you have any advice for our listeners on what they should do if uh, a tornado is identified in their area? Uh, Move to Montana. They don't have those up there. Or Arizona, for that matter. Uh, just, just a public service announcement. Arizona, no earthquakes, no tornadoes, no hurricanes. no. We have flash floods. It's about it in monsoon season. Uh, so everyone move to Arizona. This message brought to you by the Arizona Depo- uh, Chamber of Commerce. So Big D. Uh, meanwhile, retired storm chaser Bill Harding, played by Bill Paxton, and his fiance Dr. Melissa Reeves, played by Jamie Gertz, are heading out to meet Bill's former storm chasing team to get the final divorce papers from Bill's soon to be ex wife, Dr. Joe Harding, played by a very sexy Helen Hunt, who since the day her father died has sworn to hunt down as many tornadoes <laughs> as possible, not wanting this. I apologize for laughing to anyone who's experienced a tornado, not wanting the same fate to happen to someone else besides Joe. The team consists of the eccentric Dusty Davis, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, Robert Rabbit Nurick, played by Alan Ruck, who is a navigator, Lawrence, uh, the photographer, played by Jeremy Davies, Joey, played by Joey Slotnick, Alan Sanders, played by Sean Whalen, Tim Beltzer Lewis, played by Todd Field, Haynes, played by Wendell Josperher, who rides with Beltzer, totally unnecessary, and Jason Preacher Rowe, played by Scott Thompson. Yeah, and please, listeners, we're, we're not making fun of tornadoes. They're serious, they're deadly. I told you I'm afraid of them. But we're just laughing at some of the terminology that are used in this movie and some of the way that the storm chasers act. So we're, we're not mocking a real threat to you. Right, yeah. For me, the, the gist of the laughter comes from the fact that, first of all, do we need a cast this big? And when I saw, when you look at the cast on paper, you go, okay, you got Helen Hunt looking fly in her white tank top. You got Philip Seymour Hoffman, Cameron from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I mean, this is an amazing cast, and you expect amazing things from them. They didn't need half of these people, and I don't know why they're all there. No, plus they made them all over the top eccentric. Not one of them is a normal, what you'd say, a, a, a scientific mind, somebody who's analytical or what you normally see of storm chasers. The, this is like the kind of bad news bears. These are the, the outlaw storm chasers. But you talk about Helen Hunt looking good. Have you Googled her lately? She still looks good. Yeah, man, I haven't Googled Helen Hunt since like the 90s. Man, do it. It's worth it. She still looks damn good. My wife Googled her because we were debating whether or not she was dead. But <laughs> she's not dead, and she's looking fantastic. Hal is Googling her right now. We're going to take a look and uh, pulling up Google images. She looks real good. And, oh, yeah, she's, she's aging well. You know, they've got her in one photo. She's right next to Jodie Foster, and both of them look, you know, pretty outstanding. Uh, you know, compared to like Meg Ryan or Nicole Kidman, who now just kind of look like bizarre plastio faces. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm told that my girlfriend looks a lot like Helen Hunt. So that I think this bodes well for my future. I'm very excited about this. Well, talking about the your diverse and extensive cast, I'm correct in saying that Philip Seymour Hoffman he won an Academy Award. Correct? Did he win one for was it Capote? Yeah, aside from this movie, I mean, Phil Spear Hoffman, I, again, I consider a genius actor. His work in, uh, and particularly in, in The Big Lebowski, was absolutely brilliant. Uh, he can break your heart. He can make you laugh. I think he's very good. In this movie, he was absolute shit. I don't know how he got another role after this. He was annoying me, and I wasn't trapped in the chase vehicle. Uh, like Bill's wife was, but he, he was just, I, I couldn't believe that anyone would hire him after this. He was a one note clown, but uh, he got a little better with age. So let's go back to the movie here. So Bill Paxton brings his fiance. And when they said doctor, you know, Dr. Melissa Reeves, I was like, oh shit, okay, he's got a doctor. She's not a doctor. She's a reproductive therapist. That's not even a real thing. I'm somebody who went through fertility treatment with my wife. She's on the phone with a patient telling her that after she has sex to, to essentially stand on her head. That doesn't happen. That job doesn't exist. 
I think she also has a, a detailed and heartfelt conversation about somebody's penis that that they are not their penis. Yeah, because the husband is feeling like he's just a sex object you know, or, or a reproductive organ. You know, she's on the clock. She does her, fil- her fertility. You know, they have the apps now that track it. But back then, it was probably a calendar and pencil. And she called him home from work to, you know, plant his seed, you know, is hoping she would be as fertile as the Tennessee Valley. But, uh, yeah, I don't think that's a real job. I Googled it and they're sex therapists, but no reproductive therapists. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ridiculousness going on in this movie. There's there's another point where I, I started noticing early on, as soon as Bill Paxton or, or Billy makes his appearance with his old team, first of all, it's just absolutely ridiculous that in this in this situation, you need to get these papers signed for, you know, to split, and you've got to go meet up with your old team, bringing your fiancé to your ex, to your soon-to-be ex-wife. Ridiculous. But beyond that, everyone calls everything in this movie a she. The sky is a she, the truck is a she, the tornadoes are she's, storms are she's, uh, your ex-wife is a she. You know, it's it, and essentially, I, it just whenever I see a movie where they start referring to everything as she, i.e. a perfect storm, I know that shit's going to go downhill really quickly, and I wasn't wrong. Yeah, even their equipment they refer to as a she. But half this movie felt like it was a mix between Mad Max, you know, Fury Road. You had five or six jalopies with people hanging off of them, equipment just banging around, dudes blaring rock music. I'm sorry. This movie's inappropriate. You're going into an area that's been devastated by a storm. They really don't want to hear you rolling in with the loudspeaker mounted on your Winnebago, blaring Van Halen's Shine On. You're going to get lynched. This was inappropriate. Would you go into a cancer ward and start blaring some Ricky Martin and being like, woo, yeah, stage three cancer, woo. No, you wouldn't do that. And these guys shouldn't either. I mean, to be fair, Van Halen's Shine On is a much more uplifting song than Ricky Martin's Living La Vida Loca, which, you know, again, actually, there is a great irony if you go into a cancer ward playing Living the Crazy Life. Uh, should we should we roll into Hurricane Katrina and start blaring like you two to make people feel better? Don't mix rock music with uh, natural disasters. It kind of pisses people off. All right. So then Joe, who is still in love with Bill, tries to stall because she does not want the marriage to end. Aw. Joe then tells Bill she wanted him out on the field because his idea for a tornado analyzing device called Dorothy, again a she, has been built. They will put it in the path of a tornado to measure it from the inside. Four of the so-called Dorothy weather machines have been built. Haynes tells them of storm activity, and they head out. Bill's rival team shows up, led by Dr. Jonas Miller, with his assistant, Eddie, Zach Grenier. According to Bill, Jonas is in the storm-chasing business, quote, for the money, not the science. Bill sees Jonas giving an interview to some local reporters and finds out that Jonas has stolen his idea for the Dorothy weather machine, building his own version called Dot three, Bill accuses him of stealing his idea, but Jonas says it was, quote, an unrealized idea. Bill decides to stay with the team for one day in an attempt to beat Jonas. Okay, this seems like it was written as a wet dream of a weatherman. We all know they get hard-ons for storms that are coming in or, you know, natural disasters, regardless of how many people they hurt. Weathermen like it because all of a sudden they get bumped up to the lead story in front of sports. Are we really led to believe that there is a hierarchy among storm chasers? That storm chasers, there are some that are just chasing the money or that they are corporate kiss butt, like they call them? Can you name actually anyone, the a millionaire storm chaser? The guy that really hit it big and went on to retire at age 35 after chasing the right storm? Uh, I can't, you know, so that's why I think this movie is, is completely fiction. Because we know everybody who's in the storm chasing game is in it for the love of it. Other than Joe, who is trying to, you know, slay that mystical dragon, which sucked her dad out. But everyone else is, you know, in it for the the, the personal glory. Okay, so I actually looked into this, and it turns out that not to the degree depicted in this film, but there is actually a money versus science thing when it comes to uh, storm chasing. Only in the sense that there are the big time, big money uh, storm chasers that have you know serious funding for serious research, and you've got your amateurs out there who are in it for the love of just seeing the storm, capturing it on film, not necessarily um, doing any scientific work. And so, so to a degree, there is that 
parallel, but not necessarily the way they, they're doing it. But what I don't understand is Jonas is a villain. Why not just let him do his natural English accent? Carrie Ell is, is an Englishman. Just let him do the English. Why, why give him that terrible Southern accent? Because remember, we didn't need to have a, a foreign villain here. Nature is the villain. So if he spoke, if he had an accent of any of any natural, you know, of any foreign country, he would instantly become the, the evil foreigner who's coming in trying to steal our weather advancements. Yeah, and you, you like to talk about science versus the money. How the hell is Joe's band of, of, of Looney Tunes scientists? Their, their best detector of storms is Bill. They call him a human barometer. What does he do? He takes a handful of dirt, lets it spill out, and they will just follow him anywhere. Yeah, they keep referring to him as the extreme and some sort of a, a, a genius, you know, who envisioned Dorothy. His genius basically generated a, a giant trash can with some doodads hanging off of it and some balls that they couldn't even figure out how to make fly, which, again, they call the she. I don't trust any genius that refers to a machine as a she. No, I got a bigger problem with this. You're designing a machine that you will have to uh, essentially roll out and activate in the middle of one of the most deadly uh, natural phenomenon that could possibly be the center or nearby of, of a funnel cloud in a tornado. Why do you make it so overly complicated? He had to climb out into the bed of the truck flip maybe 25, 30 switches, go around the front, activate something, unlatch it, hit the button that made the siren go off. Wouldn't you think about just being able to activate it from the cab of the truck? I really wanted to see like an uh, like an Ernest uh, Saves Camp or whatever, Ernest Goes Camp, like style like catapult that just shot this thing into the tornado. But uh, the machine, Dorothy was actually based on a similar machine called Toto, uh, which never actually worked in real life. So... Uh, so maybe this entire movie was just an homage to Toto and really what would have happened if Toto had worked. So we saw the flying cows. Is this where Sharknado got its inspiration? I mean, again, the cow was completely unnecessary and they never really tell you the, the what happens to it. But uh, the minute I saw Sharknado for the first time, saw the, the, the first ad for it, I think it was on YouTube or something like that. I, I immediately thought of Twister. So I think that's that's a, a very accurate idea. And look, Sharknado was successful. There were sequels. So clearly the cow thing, they were onto something. So Bill has got this sweet new ride. Was it like a Dodge Ram, his truck? Sir, it was a Dodge Ram quad cab, uh, 19, I think it was a 97 Ram quad cab, beautiful red truck. I actually had a 2006 Dodge Dakota, uh, which was uh, modeled after the, the truck and Twister. I didn't realize until I saw Twister, but, uh, but uh, yeah, he uh, it, clearly it's his pride and joy. Yeah, but yet he only has, was it, liability insurance on it? He's got this truck in the middle of that first funnel cloud with debris flying everywhere, cows flying, that thing comes out without a scratch. Not only is it not, uh, you know, at all damaged in there, uh, you would think that with the pressure difference, uh, with the windows rolled up and that much wind going on, I mean, if you've ever seen videos of, of actual tornadoes, windows are the first thing to go in, in businesses, houses, vehicles. And so it was kind of amazing that there wasn't even a crack in the windshield. It's possible that the door seals on those aren't that great and uh, the pressure difference doesn't really exist and this is also remember why hal salstrom has cut the top off of his jeep jeep grand cherokee to not have to deal with this sort of thing no blowing out glass in that thing <laughs> that just sounded dirty so bill's team heads out and bill and joe have a frank discussion of their marriage because that's what you do then Belzer notices a small tornado, an F1, touching down on a nearby field and alerts the team. Joe and Bill drive into a ditch to get in front of it, but cannot get out of the ditch as the tornado closes in. They crash into a small wooden bridge and take cover under it. Joe wants to see the tornado up close, but Bill stops her just as the tornado lifts Joe's truck off the ground. Joe's truck falls in front of Melissa, who is driving Bill's truck. She drives around it, narrowly missing a collision. Bill comforts her as Joe inspects the damage and takes some of the sensors from the destroyed Dorothy One machine. Jonas's team shows up but is too late to see the storm and keeps driving. Joe, with no truck of her own, manages to convince Bill to use his new truck to haul the Dorothy machines. Bill's team heads out again as Bill, Joe, and Melissa ride in his truck. Another tornado, a slightly larger F2, has touched down and both Bill's team and Jonas's team are heading to intercept it. 
Bill believes the tornado will shift its track and his team heads off on a back road. Bill soon drives onto a bridge and they are caught in some water spouts, which spin the truck. The team arrives just after the incident. And while Joe celebrates with the team, Melissa breaks down questioning Bill's old lifestyle. Okay, so in the Midwest, the only thing that's deadlier than tornadoes, obviously, are these knucklehead storm chasers driving 80 miles an hour down a back road. They cut through people's property. They're driving through cornfields. How the fuck do they know there's not kids out there playing or or a farmer working on his equipment? They must kill probably 10% as many people in traffic fatalities than storms do by wind and debris. Yeah, and aside from where they're driving, it's what they're driving. As you mentioned, it's sort of a Mad Max sort of thing. I don't understand why both teams need like eight vehicles to make this happen. And it seems like as the movie goes on, there are more vehicles added. Like first it's Winnebago, then a station wagon pops up. Next, you know, you got uh, you got one of those uh, push carts from a railroad track. Like, I don't know what the hell's going on out there. But why do they need, I mean, did anyone understand why they needed so many vehicles to chase the tornadoes? I just thought it made it entertaining. I was waiting for them to have a eunuch strapped to the top of one with a flamethrowing guitar and speakers. It's in case the tornado splits up. You can follow each of them. Oh, but none of the other vehicles actually chase the fucking tornado. They let their one pickup truck chase the tornado and the other 18 vehicles just camp out at a distance. Right. And I understand that this is a day where there's supposed to be a record number of tornadoes, but I lived in Ohio for five years and I saw one tornado up close. The fact that they're seeing multiple tornadoes in a day, I find highly improbable. And then again, for a tornado you know, genius, somebody who understands tornadoes a ton, I don't understand why Billy a- and Joe go under a bridge. If you know anything about the, the dynamics of, of, of wind, the physics there, a bridge is not going to offer you any protection from a tornado. Up till about three years ago, the Weather Channel still used to tell people to hide under bridges. So maybe they were watching the Weather Channel before they went out to chase the tornado. No, but I think what the Weather Channel tells you is those major concrete overpasses. True. That you, that you get up so that you're actually not down at ground level. You're still elevated so the wind can go through. But the object here is to deploy Dorothy, right? They get a fucking bullseye on the first tornado. That tornado goes right over the truck. Why didn't they just go try to activate it? Look, you activate Dorothy. Wait, movie's over. Great. 24 minutes. Okay, this this is going to be the third time on the podcast that I've referenced Lord of the Rings and talked about if they just given the fucking ring to an eagle and had it dropped it into Mount Doom, the fucking the movie would have been over in five minutes. It's not about the final destination. It's about the journey together. So we talked before about you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman being inappropriate. Uh, Joe has now lost her truck. Dorothy is destroyed. It's flipped over and almost killed them. Up comes, you know, Philip, who obviously has Tourette's or some other kind of problem, you know, restraining himself. And he's screaming, that was awesome. That was awesome. She just missed the truck. He's wildly inappropriate and situationally unaware. Yeah, I think in addition, he's on the verge of sexually harassing everybody in this movie. Even Meg, you know, he, he would he'd molest anybody. He's he's touching people. He's always kind of making wild eyes. Uh, well, I think that's maybe why they are the outlaw meteorologists. No one wants to fund them because they're molesting everyone. So, uh, so yeah, so Meg, speaking of Meg, so the team goes to visit Joe's aunt, Meg Green, played by Lois Smith, in the nearby town of Wakita, Oklahoma, to rest and, of course, eat, because that's what you do on a record day of tornadoes. Meg tells Joe privately that Joe's marriage with Bill ended because, quote, he didn't keep his part of the bargain. As the team is watching TV, it mentions an F3 tornado is active, and the team heads out. Bill and Joe drive together in his truck, and Melissa rides with Dusty in his converted school bus of molestation. They almost crash into Jonas' team in an attempt to beat them. Bill's team attempts to figure out where the tornado is because, according to their computers, it is heading toward them on the same road. Bill and Joe realize it's over a hill, and they go through a hailstorm to find it. Upon finding the tornado, Bill and Joe try to set up Dorothy 2, but run out of time. A power pole falls on the truck, ruining Dorothy 2. The tornado then lifts back into the clouds. Joe attempts to gather the scattered sensors, but Bill, realizing that the tornado has not dissipated, but is simply back building, pulls her into the truck as the tornado drops once more. They drive to a safe distance where Joe jumps out of the truck and again attempts to gather the scattered sensors. She grows angry about Bill's attempt to stop her, but Bill tells Joe she is obsessed to succeed with Dorothy to prevent what happened to her family from happening again. 
He also tells her that he still has feelings for her. Melissa and Joe's whole team hear their conversation over the CB radio. Yeah, that's one hell of a sensitive mic on the CB radio. Yeah, you know, and the the right after a tornado to be able to hear this conversation at a distance from the truck. But besides, we were I was saying that you know it's inappropriate to roll into a town that was just devastated. Let let's step back. Joe's father was killed by a tornado. She is doing this out of out of a, a sense of revenge and anger. Wouldn't you be kind of sensitive to your coworker and not be screaming joyfully every time you see a Cat 3 or Cat 4? Only when you mention the legendary Cat 5 does, does the team suddenly hush and shh, Joe's father was killed by a Cat 5. Yeah, I mean, the whole tone of this of this movie is all over the place that we've talked about before. Uh, you know, th- it's a movie about serious devastation, people nearly losing their lives, people having relatives who have lost their lives, and this fearful situation, people losing their property, uh, competitions between the, the truists and the rich, and all that. And yet, for some reason, they've got to have these bizarre, jovial moments that make no sense. I mean, the whole scene where they go to see Aunt Meg, you've got her cooking for everybody, everybody's having a good time. Uh, if you're a serious storm chaser, you're on a record day of tornadoes, you're not taking a shower, coming out with your sexy shirt unbuttoned or blow drying your hair perfectly like uh, like Helen Hunt did. Uh, and then and then you've got these weird moments where, you know, like Aunt Meg, they go see her and suddenly she's got enough steak and eggs for 10 people, potatoes and gravy, and they're having a party in the middle of all this. What the hell is going on? Uh, I'm, I'm more a fan of all the over the top jargon that I would love to know if it was true. You're entering the suck zone. I, I don't think the suck zone is a, a scientific term. N- no. <laughs> <laughs> also, the the one that gets the whole group to we'll be quiet. We'll just run through this here. Okay. Uh, where is is an F5, you know, referred to as the finger of God? You've got the finger of God. Uh, they see When they see the water spouts, they refer to the, oh, it's sisters. You got the sidewinder. And I do wonder if, like, in the 90s, you know, I don't, I don't remember this from high school, but I, I wonder if people were just walking around using all this terminology like they just learned something from Twister. Well, you know there was definitely uh, amateur meteorologists who were getting little boners in the theater. Well, yeah, I mean, it's Helen Hunt in a white tank top. I think we already went over that, Big D. So that evening, Bill's team heads to a drive-in theater where Joe signs the divorce papers, finally, while Melissa is in a motel room across the road watching a weather report of more t- tornadoes nearby. Dusty is watching the radar. Both Melissa's TV and the TV at the concession stand lose their perception as Dusty warns Bill that an F4 tornado is heading right for him. Everyone takes shelter in the pit of a car mechanic's garage while Joe watches it approach, spellbound, much like she had when she was a girl when her father was killed, until Bill's shouting breaks her trance and she gets the theater employees to take cover. The tornado obliterates the theater, destroying several of the team's vehicles, and Preacher is hurt when he is hit in the head by a flying hubcap. The tornado passes and the team emerges to inspect the damage. Dusty looks at the radar to find that the same tornado is now heading directly for Wakita. Bill tells Melissa they are leaving to check on Aunt Meg, and Melissa peacefully breaks up with him, saying that she does not want to compete with his need to chase tornadoes. She tells him she is not at all upset about breaking up and assures Bill that Joe needs him more. Upon arriving in Wakita, they find the town is destroyed, and Joe realizes there had been no warning. Bill and Joe find Meg home on, uh, Meg's home on the verge of collapse. Upon entering, they find Meg pinned underneath a bookshelf. Joe and Bill rescue her and her dog mows before the house collapses. Meg manages to escape the tornado with nothing more than, quote, a bump on the head and a broken wrist and is taken to a hospital. Before leaving, she tells Joe that she needs to succeed to make sure what happened to Akita doesn't happen again. Dusty listens to the radio, hearing that meteorologists are predicting rare F5 tornadoes. Finger of God. Joe comes up with a way to make Dorothy work while watching some wind chimes. She has Bill's team fabricate pinwheels out of aluminum cans and attaches them to the sensors with screws to make them fly. Besides the fun fact that uh, Gene in high school was also known as the finger of God, why were they in the drive-in theater? I got to admit, because right now it is 1 a.m. Eastern, uh, so I was a bit loopy when I was watching this a little bit earlier. Did I miss something? Why did a group of storm chasers take time out of their busy day to go see a drive-in? Yeah, so they're actually at the motel right next to the drive-in. It just happens to be a place where I think they thought it'd be fun to have a, a tornado. Uh, but they really did have a good setup here. I mean, when we talk about some of the upsides of this movie, 
if you're going to have a scene of the tornado, why not have it near a drive-in theater next to a giant hangar bay where you've got a, a, a mechanics pit going on there and a concession stand. There's all sorts of fun things for a tornado to play with. Another thing I don't understand, Big D, I mean, great point. What are they doing hanging out there? I think they're, you know, they're chasing the storms and it's nightfall. But also, what are all these people doing at the drive-in knowing that there have been you know, F4 and F3 tornadoes uh, in, in the area? And you've got the weather forecast, I mean, on TV telling you that there's tornadoes in the area. Uh, I got to you know, think that maybe the people of the Midwest are strong and have really a, a, a fortitude to fight. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to run from no tornado, and they're going to go out there. But it doesn't seem believable that you'd have all these cars packed out there with kids, families, uh, but this setup is the actual layout of the entire Universal Studios ride. You go through the queue, and the end ride is the simulator that you go through this storm at the drive-in. You know, to answer your question about the Midwest, I, I think staring at the storms is a real Southern thing, actually, because in Texas, they'll go out and look at a tornado. Uh, in Florida, you know, the hurricane's coming. New Orleans, you have people still like, you know, uh, knowing that a tropical storm is coming, they want to see what's going on. In the Midwest, from my experience, living in Ohio, uh, people took that shit very seriously, and they would they would hide out. Uh, it was always funny because the first thing to go would be milk and eggs. All the grocery stores would sell out of milk and eggs, which is ironically something that's going to go bad in your fridge if the power goes out. So I never really understood that part. Yeah, so you're talking about how they were hiding in the, uh, you know, the the mechanics bay underneath the, was it a quick oil change? Yeah, no, it looked like an auto repair uh, shop with like a junkyard attached. So my wife, uh, when she was first learning to drive, uh, she went in, this is before we were together, she went in to get her oil change. You know how they have the guy who kind of ground guides you straight on? She actually got the entire front right quarter panel of her car stuck into the bay because she veered off. Uh, and they had to winch the entire car out, screwed the whole front end up. And to this day, she is not capable of driving into a quick change uh, shop. She has to have someone else pull the car in for her. So speaking of wives, uh, th- this breakup with Melissa, I wish that every breakup went this way, where you just said, she just looks at you and goes, you know what, clearly uh, I can't give you all the things that you need, and I understand, and I know my way home, and you know, good luck to you. They need you more than I do. Wouldn't that be just amazing? Yeah, all it takes is people saying actually what they think. So many times, men and women just worry about how something will be perceived or not being cruel or being mean or they're worried they're the only one feeling it. If people just actually spoke their mind, the world would be a much better place. Um, I understand they haven't perfected an early warning system that they can't tell people exactly where Tino is going to be at any time. But Aunt Meg seems wise. She's been there for a long time. Her house is, you know, in Wakita, uh, right in Tornado Alley. Um, does it seem strange that Aunt Meg somehow, and she's watching TV too. I mean, the scene clearly shows watching TV. The TV doesn't cut to any sort of storm uh, news, and she doesn't seem to even expect that there's a, a tornado coming. No, and also back in that time, didn't they also have the sirens that would go off, or is this before that was instituted? Oh, yeah, in the 90s, they clearly had tornado sirens. That was a, that was a big thing. And, and I know I lived in a town where in, in Lima, Ohio, where they tested them regularly. I mean, they are, they are very loud, and you know when they're going off. Maybe that was why she had that artistic uh, you know, wind chime slash uh, art piece out there, that that tells her when the twisters are coming. Uh, but she really didn't do a good job of getting to a safe place, and she's trapped in the wreckage of her home until you know our storm chasers arrive and again... Philip Seymour Hoffman decides to scream, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, as presumably her neighbors are trapped and potentially dying. But this is a great event for the Storm Chasers. Yeah, I love that they take the opportunity to exclaim steak and eggs as they pull it out of the window, as if that is her only identity to them, is that she's a source of food. Her entire home is destroyed. Uh, she's injured. She's not you know, dead. But just thank God that beautiful golden retriever, that was a great looking dog. Yeah, Mose is a beautiful dog. A few hours later, as dawn begins to break, Bill and Joe come alongside a huge, mile-wide F5 tornado in the countryside. They put Dorothy 3 on the road in front of the tornado and then back up, but the winds push Dorothy around, and then a tree knocks Dorothy 3 over, scattering the sensors again. The storm turns toward Bill and Joe, and they attempt to drive away. They become stuck when a tree wedges underneath the back end of their truck. A tanker fuel truck is pushed along the road toward their truck by the tornado, uh, and knocks them free before exploding. 
Bill drives around the wreckage through the fireball, narrowly avoiding catastrophe. Bill drives ahead of the tornado, dodging as it drops farm vehicles on the road in front of him. They end up driving through a small house that is rolled by the tornado onto the road. Joe and Bill, noticing that Jonas is driving too close to the tornado, warn him to change course, but he ignores them. Eddie wants to heed Bill's warning, but Jonas orders him to keep driving. The tornado hurls a section of a TV tower through their windshield, impaling Eddie. Both teams watch in horror as Jonas's truck is lifted up by the tornado and thrown into the ground where it explodes, killing both Eddie and Jonas. So maybe Joe is on to something. Maybe a tornado is not just a, you know, a natural phenomenon, because this tornado seems to have it out for Joe. It's coming after Joe and Billy. It's dropping every piece of a John Deere dealership directly straight in front of the truck. Maybe this storm does have a vendetta against Joe and her family. Yeah, it, you know, and it starts out with vehicles. Uh, it advances to trucks. You've got TV towers flying around, cows. Uh, thankfully, the cow didn't hit anybody. But it, it definitely seems to be that, you know, on one hand, you could take the cynical view and go, why is so much shit flying around in this tornado? But on the other hand, you know, I appreciate the fact that that this was one point where the movie actually shined was that how often you get to see a truck go through a house? How often do you get to see a fuel tanker exploding in front of you? Uh, this was actually kind of the only fun part of the movie for me. You, when you said a small house, bullshit. This was a two-story family home. They drive through the window as Bill proclaims, I'm going in. He drives through the side of the house, up a flight of stairs that somehow then collapses and out the backside. We talked last week about raising Arizona, about the construction quality of mobile homes. What the hell was this house made out of? Balsa wood and Ikea tables? Yeah, I do feel like this movie could have been a lot stronger if they'd taken it seriously. I mean, this is a movie that would be, I think, a prime candidate for a remake, where you take the premise of Twister, but you actually make it a gritty movie for adults, where the actual damage that would be caused by all this stuff and, you know, really make the impact felt. I think that's that's what's cartoonish about this movie is that it doesn't take any of the subject matter seriously, but starts with the death of someone's father and never really capitalizes on that emotional impact. No, and I think it's also giving people uh, you know, a, a dangerous sense of security with storms. I wouldn't be surprised if this led to people thinking that they could calculate where storms are going to go and, and would, you know, almost become amateur storm chasers themselves they're teaching you reckless actions it's okay as long as you stay on the road you stay a little further away uh, you, you can drive away from it they're teaching you things that you should never do you should run and hide not chase them and definitely stay away from any windshield or tv tower oh that murder was brutal so Bill and Joe conclude there's one last option left. They head toward a new intercept point, turn on Dorothy 4 without releasing it from its moorings on the truck bed, and then drive the truck straight at the tornado. With the truck on cruise control, they jump out, letting it drive into the cent center of the tornado, where it successfully deploys Dorothy 4. The team starts to celebrate as the Dorothy sensors work, analyzing the inside of the tornado, but then they notice the tornado shifting. Bill and Joe notice it as well and flee to a nearby farm. They first take cover in a barn, but it is filled with sharp metal tools. Imagine that. Uh, the storm destroys the barn and they dodge debris as they run to take cover in a small outbuilding. They find metal pipes inside this shelter and tie themselves to the pipes with leather belts. The tornado destroys the structure and they are pulled upside down while anchored to the pipes. They manage to see the inside of the F5 tornado as it passes over them. It is filled with lightning and a smaller tornado in the core. Seconds later, the entire storm dissipates, and the family from the farm comes out of their underground storm shelter and observe their damaged farm. Bill and Joe debate who will run the lab and who will analyze the new data from Dorothy while the rest of the team arrives. The movie ends with Bill and Joe reconciling their relationship with the kiss while the team celebrates their accomplishment. Uh, again, our storm chasers are very happy uh, as the farmer and his family emerge from their bunker to see that they're their entire livelihood, their farm is destroyed, and they're screaming because they're they're so joyful that they've collected some data. I'm sure that won't uh, make the farmers feel any better. But I started to remember that the MythBusters had covered this. You were you a MythBusters fan? Uh, I mean, I didn't really watch it regularly, but the the clips that I've watched, that I've searched for specifically, I've been very appreciative of, including the uh, if you shoot a gas tank on a car, will it explode? Yeah, so they've done a lot of, of good ones that 
really kind of go against what your normal intuition would be like shooting bullets underwater that if you're like two or three feet underwater you're completely safe that because water doesn't compress the bullet when it hits it it'll break up as long as it's not a low caliber uh, like a handgun or a musket any high-powered automatic weapon you're safe but they did twist their myths and they tested whether or not you know some of the modern storm chasing vehicles could withstand uh, an f5 it passed they did some small personal tornado protection shelters. I could have sworn they did the test with the belt. I think that might have held you down, but you would look like a pin cushion at the end. Right. I mean, it's one of those things um, people you know, think about when they get in a car accident, that they'll brace themselves against the, the dashboard. You're going to break a bone there. Another one they talk about is, you know, in the movies where you see people, the classic, like holding on to another person who's got a parachute on. Uh, if you loop your arms around those parachute straps, your arms are breaking. Like that's, again, you strap yourself to a, a pole, you're going to suffer massive, massive body trauma, including broken bones, uh, lacerations. You're not going to come out looking pretty. Uh, I'd be surprised if you come out of it even conscious or able to to breathe with the, uh, with the amount of uh, pressure uh, that's generated. Uh, in addition, I mean, uh, really the tornado only threat that's presented in this movie is that it can pick things up and drop them in front of you. I was really hoping for some sort of a bigger lesson here. And really the lesson was, uh, again, just as long as you stay marginally out of the way, you're going to be fine. Well, you know how they say that uh, Top Gun in the 80s was responsible for a, a surge in uh, people joining the Navy and trying to become pilots. Do you think that Twister is responsible for people, you know, just really rushing out and trying to either become meteorologists or storm chasers? How do you think I got this Jeep with the top cut off? Well, maybe driving under a low bridge or something, or or was it a, a dream you had as a young child? What was it that drove your love of all things weather? Got nothing. I got nothing on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, to me, uh, this movie really could have ended with Dorothy for flying, right? The success there, and you could have just ended it right there. There was this, this last scene is completely unnecessary. Uh, I don't know why they put it in there. And honestly, this was, uh, again, at two hours, this movie already felt very, very long. We talked, you know, recently about Pulp Fiction and how that two hours flew by. Raising Arizona, uh, 90 minutes flew by. This movie at two hours was, it was just lengthy. And I think that they really could have done with cutting some of these scenes out, you know, the the steak and eggs. Uh, and again, this last scene, uh, with, which was completely implausible, unnecessary, and insensitive. Even though it was two hours, it was at a fast pace that it was just so much of it was redundant and repetitive. You didn't need to do it. And I also, maybe I'm dark, I think some of our, our storm chasing crew, it would have been more impactful if they had died. At the end, don't make them so gleeful. Make it that there is a sacrifice for the science. If one of the vehicles gets shredded and they come and they say, yeah, you know, Dorothy flew, but guess what? We lost four of our team. That somber ending, I think, would have been a much better bookend on the movie. So that brings us to the point we, we've discussed the hell out of this movie. We're going to talk about uh, our, our ratings of the movie. And, and what we use, if you're joining us for the first time or just don't pay attention, uh, is the Shat Meter. The Shat Meter is going to tell us exactly how many wipes it would take to get this movie off of your respective bum. Uh, and thankfully, we've got a tornado scale already. So we'll use the modified uh, Enhanced Fujita uh, shat meter on this one. So a, a five wiper will be a, a finger of God, if you will. Uh, they just blasted right through your pants and uh, has left a absolute uh, amazing destruction with a smaller finger of God inside of it. Uh, and a, a zero, so that would be the, a terrible movie. Uh, and a, a great movie, a perfect score would be zero wipes. Uh, the, the storm never even came. Uh, all is tranquil at Aunt Meg's house, and uh, your pants are clean and dry as an Arizona afternoon. So uh, with that, well, we'll start with you, Big D. Uh, how, do, how do you rate this one? God, I feel, I feel kind of torn because it is a hot mess. It, it, it's, it's a Michael Bay schlock you know, disaster movie. Oh, God, it, it's pretty fucking bad. It's really bad. The... Other than the cast, if, if you know what it is, if it wasn't for Bill Paxson and how lovable he is and how ridiculous his lines are, but he delivers them in such kind of a, a goofy, lovable way, I think the movie would be a five if that was it. But because of Bill, he kind of brings it back in. It's something that I wouldn't want to watch again anytime soon, but it, it's it's pretty bad. I think I think it's a four. 
All right, that's four wipes from Big D. We'll move on now to Hal Salstrom, our, our special guest. Uh, Hal, on a scale of five wipes being terrible, zero wipes being a perfect movie, uh, where would you rank Twister? I would almost give it a five like you, Big D. Uh, but I would say not so much Bill Paxton, but the few good special effects and the, the short amount of time it felt fun. I'll, I'll go ahead and give it, let's say, four and a half for some decent special effects. But that was such a brief percentage of the two hours as a whole. It's, yeah, like you said, not something I look forward to watching again anytime soon or ever. And to, and to round it out, I think I'm going to go with the four wipes as well. I completely agree with Hal Salstrom. Uh, both of us having seen incredible weather patterns across the country uh, in the chop top Jeep. Uh, I would say that this is a four wipe again, mainly because again, for 19, 19- 96 these these uh, effects were ahead of their time a lot of the practical effects looked very expensive to produce and, and were actually pretty good also in addition this movie is infinitely quotable uh, so that gives it some points we had uh, you know red meat we crave sustenance and as you mentioned big D you're entering the suck zone uh, and and of course he's gonna rue the day he came up against the extreme imminent ruage. That's right. So for those quotes, and also who can forget, was it Game Over Man, Game Over part of this as well? No, that was Aliens. Fuck. <laughs> All right, that would have been a, that would have been a, a one more point. So we're, we're going to go with, so that brings us to about a 4.16 uh, score. So let's go ahead and round it at, at four. I'm not sure where that puts it against other movies that we've watched, but it's not great. Uh, you know what it is? It was a shit movie that was done well. Or was it a great movie that was done shittily? <laughs> Oh man, this is fucking down there. Okay, so so Gene, you said we were at a, like a what was it, a four point one two? Uh four point two if you round it to the tenth. So this is our twenty second movie. And there has only been one that is worse. And it was Highlander. Westworld from nineteen seventy three is a little bit better. And God, I can't believe I'm saying this. The last Starfighter is significantly a better film. That feels wrong. I mean, like, I know Twister was horrible, but did, did we just hate this because we expected so much out of it? I feel like that is an unjust score to, to put it below The Last Starfighter, which to me was absolute turd with horrible effects. No, but the, I think each movie, you really got to take it on its own merits. Last Starfighter, it, it was a kind of a good story. They were limited by technology, but we respected what they tried to do, pushing you know, the field of CGI. Highlander, again, it was entertaining. Some of the execution was off. We're never going to find... Uh, it, we're already doing it. And, I, and we got shit on. Somebody wrote me and said, you know, how did you guys tear apart Blade Runner? It's a great movie. It's just, And I said, dude, when's the last time you watched it? And he goes, four years ago. And I said, okay. He goes, y- you might have some you know, recency bias. This movie, it is... And like I just said, it is a bad movie it, it is a soda pop fast food movie that is executed well that doesn't make it a good movie and what i normally gauge it on is would i want to watch this again and you know what i would rather lost boys is a 3.3 i'd rather watch that i'd rather watch commando i would not want to sit through twister again would you i, I was going to go all the way out there and say last starfighter i'd easily watch last starfighter again over twister uh, I totally agree. Yeah, I think a key, I think a key point there too is Last Starfighter. If you ask me who's in it, I, I couldn't name a single actor in the Last Starfighter. But this one, you got a you got a star studded cast. You got ninety two million dollars to produce it. It was made in ninety seven. When Starfighter was what eighty four or something 84. like that. Eighty two, eighty three. Eighty four. Yeah. So when when you look at it from that perspective, you got to expect more out of it. I mean, again, we just talked about Pulp Fiction, which came out in nineteen ninety four and kicks the shit out of this movie. So, you know, the, yeah, in context, it's it's actually not that great. I think one of the issues is the repetitive nature. You know, the villain, the true villain in the movie here is the twister. They they go back to the well too many times. It would have been better if they almost held off on it, where the first half of the movie, they wasn't them immediately getting hit by debris and dodging it and chasing. Build it up. Don't show us the true power of the tornado. They revealed the monster in the first act, and then they just kept going back to it. And by the end, I was like, oh, yeah, wow. Ooh, look, another twister. There's a Cat 5. It's a mile wide. Whereas the first one, I was blown away. It just became too much. 
All right, so that's in the books. Raj, I hope you didn't love this movie because uh, we apologize. No, no, he did. He did love it. Don't you remember him last week when I said this is the last star? This is the uh, this is the Starship Trooper of natural disaster movies, and he said I was crazy that this was a great movie. Yeah, I think Raj associates Twister with with making America great again. I think is the thing that it's got that that wholesome, you know, uh, all American Oklahoma sort of you know flag waving, Dodge Ram driving sort of feel to it. Uh, but anyway, uh, so that it goes down to the books. Four point two for for Twister. We do not recommend this movie. Uh, to anyone who has any semblance of intelligence or realistic expectations of weather and phenomenon. Uh, for our next movie uh, coming up, uh, next week we'll be doing the best of Charlie Sheen. Big D, you want to tell us uh, what movies are up for vote? Yeah, the Charlie Sheen, we've closed it out. And the nominees were Wall Street from 87, Major League from 89, Red Dawn from 84, and Young Guns from 88. And again, we have a clear winner, Major League from 1989 and perfect timing with the baseball season just opening up. Now, for me, Young Guns and Red Dawn are two of my favorite movies of, of all time. I was I was very uh, hurt by this vote, people. I mean, five times more people voted for Major League than Red Dawn. I, I feel like this is some sort of a cosmic joke being played on me, but at least we don't have to watch Wall Street, so I'll take it. Major League is not a terrible movie. I think we're going to have a lot of fun with it. Again, a, a great cast in this one, and it's, uh, it's, it's one that I think will still, hopefully, still make us laugh. And this is why we put it out to vote, because there are certain movies that I think are slam dunks, that there's no doubt they're going to win. Like Back to the Future, Lost. You know, Red Dawn, we've had up before, Lost. Predator was up twice and lost. So either all of our listeners are punking us or we don't necessarily love the same movies as everyone else. Dude, Willow has been up like every week since we started, I think. We'll be like we'll be like Charlie Sheen movies, Willow. Like disaster movies, Willow. It just cannot get in there. And again, I point out that 20 episodes ago or whatever, however many episodes I I started, 15 episodes ago, whatever. I I got started because I was promised we were going to get to do Willow. That's that's still what I'm waiting for. Well, hold on. You you may have you may have spoken too soon because that's in the queue. So let me see where we stand with that because we did a Val Kilmer week. Oh, it's winning right now. So look what you you see. You spoke too soon. We have the best of Val Kilmer will come week coming up here in like four weeks, and it's Willow, Top Gun, Heat, and Real Genius. And right now Willow is in the lead. So either you have just motivated people to vote against you because they don't like you or to rally behind your cause. We'll see. I don't know. It might be, it might just, I might actually retire after we do Willow just because no movie is, is better. I'm going to be honest with everybody. Honestly, here's the thing is I don't remember Willow at all, except for you really are great. That's literally the only thing about the movie I remember. So I'd actually really like to watch it. Just let me watch the damn movie people. Uh, with that, this that concludes our uh, this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. Uh, Facebook, we are uh, just search for Shat the Movies podcast. The website is shatthemovies.com. If you'd like to email us, we're hosts at Shat the Movies. You can email us with any sort of a recommendation of a movie you'd like to see us review. Uh, or any feedback you've got about the show. You could yell at us about how Twister was the greatest movie of all time. Uh, make sure to use all caps so we know where you're yelling. We're everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please be sure to leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. Also, you can sh- check out our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, and American Gods. Uh, which is coming up later this month. You can find all this information on our website, shatontv.com. Also, join me on Snapchat uh, at shatontv. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D and Roger Roper, along with our special guest, Hal Salstrom, thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we hope to see you next week. Take care. And the